In this video, Wade Thompson shares a presentation on identifying ECM motors and PSC motors in forced air furnaces. Uh, the first 20 minutes of the video is Wade's presentation and then the last 20 minutes is a Q&A. So uh, you can kind of pick and choose what will work best for you. Enjoy the video. Okay, so I've been asked uh, by Matt Turner and by a few auditors now to uh, provide some guidance and training on how to identify PSC motors and ECM motors. And so for the purpose of this presentation, we'll be referring just to the types of blower motors that we find in furnaces because those are the ones that you're mostly dealing with as auditors. And so the two different types that you're going to run into, the only two types you're going to run into, are PSC motors, which stands for Permanent Split Capacitor, and that'll make sense to you why they call it that once we get through this presentation. And then the other one you might run into is called a ECM, or Electronically Commutated Motor, and we'll talk a little bit about the differences between those two. Bear in mind, guys, this class is strictly for motor identification. We're not going to get into service or installation. Those are uh, more technical classes. So again, we're just going to go over some quick and easy ways you guys can determine what type of motor is in a furnace, because as auditors, you're evaluating some of the motors for replacement. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. OK. <clears throat> All right. So PSC motor, permanent split capacitance motor, or permanent split capacitor, first and fo foremost will always have a remote capacitor attached to it. So that's this little guy over here. And there'll always be two leads. They're typically brown and brown and white, but you will find them in other colors. I've seen them in purple and I've seen them in blue. But most commonly, there'll be a brown and a brown and white lead that runs to some sort of remote capacitor, thus the name permanent split capacitor motor. It's the most common motor that you'll find in furnaces, especially the older furnaces that we deal with. And the other attribute of a PSC motor is it will always have multiple speed leads. So you can see here we've got high, medium, and low, and then a common. And those multiple speed leads will always attach to speed pins on a circuit board. And the speed pins will always be marked low, medium, high, or heat cool park, so on and so forth. So in this case, we have three speed leads, a common, and our two capacitor leads. That's the quickest way to really identify these. If there's a capacitor with it, it's a permanent split capacitor motor and could be evaluated to be replaced with an ECM. <clears throat> so here I've got a picture of a PSC motor. Again, you can see all the leads coming out. We've got the capacitor over here. I've got some better pictures of a capacitor coming up. But again, two wires always going to the capacitor, in this case brown and brown and white. We have four speed leads, black, red, yellow, blue, and then our common lead. And then you also have a ground somewhere. Okay? And so these speeds are typically black is low, red is high, yellow is medium low, blue is medium high, and then our common. Okay, so that's one quick way to determine what type of motor you got. Does it have a capacitor and what are the speed leads doing? Okay, I mentioned the speed leads will always connect to pins on the circuit board. So here you can see we have our blue, yellow, black, and red wires. In this case, the board, rather than being marked low, medium, and high, and so forth, is cool, heat, park, and park. The park terminals are just bonus terminals that do nothing. So in this case, this furnace is using two of the four available speeds. So red on cool, which would be the high speed lead, black on heat, which would be the low speed. And we have two bonus speed leads. If we wanted to pull the red off and put it on park and move this one over here, we could change the speed for cooling. Or same with heating. You can swap these leads around to change what speed the motor runs on when it sees a signal from one of these two terminals. So again, the ones that say park, they're just dead terminals, just somewhere to put these two wires so they don't hang out there in the breeze and short out on something. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing about PSC motors is they all, every time, every single one of them, have cooling vents on the end of the motor. 
So you can reach your hand right into the motor, and if you fill these holes on the end of the motor, they'll be both on the back and the front. Those are cooling vents. That allows air to get in and cool the motor because PSC motors, by nature, produce a ton of heat. It's part of what makes them so inefficient. Um, just so you know, these holes, when they get plugged full of dirt and crap, it actually affects the performance of the motor because now you're eliminating its ability to cool itself and it'll start to overheat and it will become more inefficient. Eventually they can overheat them to the point where they've ruined themselves. And again, here's a good picture of a capacitor. Okay, capacitors can be oval shaped or round. And again, we have two wires. There will always be two wires on a PSC motor that go to some remote capacitor. So if it's got a remote capacitor, the multiple speed leads that go to individual pins and cooling vents, you can guarantee it's a PSC motor or a permanent split capacitor motor. Okay? Any questions so far on PSCs before I talk about ECMs and the differences on ECMs? The only question I have is the solid brown wire normally goes to the Herm side on the capacitor, correct? Well, now you're talking uh, compressors. Okay? So if you have a capacitor that has a Herm marking on it, that is a capacitor for a compressor. You typically won't find Herm. Well, I take that back. On condensers, they have a multiple capacitor, which has common Herm and fan. Okay? So again, we're just talking about blower motors for furnaces. But yes, on a condenser, you'll have a capacitor with three terminals on it, and there'll be common Herm and fan. And I see them on evaporative coolers all the time. That's just standard still, standard motor, right? Standard PSC motor? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. I haven't seen a three-prong capacitor on an evaporative cooler, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. Yeah, but who knows what they replace them with, so maybe that's what it <laughs> Well, yeah, and that's true. Someone could have just had something in their van to replace it with. So. And again, for this presentation, we're talking strictly furnace blower motors. So, yes, there are other motors out there for other applications, but we're just talking about furnace blower motors here. Yes, and as long as the farads add up anyway. Yep. All right, so we're going to go ahead and talk about ECMs a little bit. So one of the key points on an ECM motor is they're always going to have, with few exceptions, and we'll talk about the exceptions, they're going to have this big old 16-pin connector. And some of the older ones might only be a 12-pin connector, but they're always going to have this great big 16- or 12-pin connector followed by another 5- or 4-pin connector. And they're going to use these Molex plugs. There's 16 pins on there, 5 on that one. That is the most common ECM, factory-installed ECM setup you'll see. We'll talk a little bit about retrofit aftermarket ECMs towards the end. But factory-installed ECM motors are going to have these two big old Molex plugs. This one will always be 16 or 12 pin. This will always be 4 or 5 pin. The other thing is ECM motors have no capacitor. There will be no remote capacitor associated with this motor. Okay? That's a dead giveaway. If there's not two wires running from the motor to a capacitor, it's not a PSC motor. It's more than likely an ECM. Here I've just got a close-up of an ECM motor in a furnace. And again, we're seeing the 16-pin Molex connector. Notice that not every pin has a wire in it. Some will have a wire in every pin, some will not. Okay? That's normal, but the key thing here is we got these two big Molex connectors plugged into the side of the motor. Pretty dead giveaway that you're dealing with an ECM motor. Okay? The other thing is on factory installed ECMs, that Molex plug, all of the wires will always go to another Molex plug on the board, and it'll be marked says motor connector or motor or something like that. They call, sometimes call it circulator. So you'll have a 16 or 12 pin Molex and you trace those wires back. They will always go to a corresponding 16 or 12 pin Molex connector hooked right on the board and it will always be marked. Okay. Another dead giveaway is if the board has a CFM light. ECM motors will always have this CFM indicator. Some older ones, you'll see a separate circuit board called the fan or circulator circuit board, but it'll still have this CFM light. This light actually flashes one time for every 100 CFM that that fan is delivering. 
So if you ever wonder, hmm, I wonder how much air that's moving, if you count that light, how many times it flashes, one time for every 100 CFM. So if you're seeing stuff like that in the furnace, pretty dead giveaway that you're dealing with an ECM rather than a PSC. <clears throat> Here's the other thing is ECM motors are comprised of two parts. Over here we have the actual motor. Okay? This is where the stator and the rotor and all that stuff is located. And the back of the motor, this is called the module. And you can see our 16-pin connector here. On the other side of that is the 5-pin connector. This is what converts AC current to DC current and causes this thing to work and spin. And you'll notice we're looking at this from the inside, but there's no cooling holes in the back of this. And next I'll show you a picture from the other side. But the module is always bolted or clamped right to the back of the motor. Okay? And you can see on this motor here, our cooling holes are up here on the side, there and there. So because of the construction of an ECM, two components, the motor and the module, ECM motors don't have cooling vents on the end of the motor. So they'll be just flat. You can reach in the furnace, rub your hand across it. If there's no cooling holes in it, it's not a PSC motor. PSC motors and furnaces always, without exception, have cooling vents in the back and the front. You have ECM motors do not. Okay? And again, it's just because of that design, because we have a module that controls the conversion of electricity from AC to DC, and it mounts to the back of the motor, and now this motor has cooling holes on the side. And ECM motors don't produce nearly as much heat as PSC motors, so they don't need all that extra cooling anyway. It's part of what makes them better motors and more efficient. So now we have this. This is called the Evergreen Retrofit ECM motor. So far up to this point, everything I've been referring to has been factory installed ECMs. So they're installed by the factory in the furnace before it goes out. But it's possible you run into these. These are what you're evaluating to replace should you evaluate a furnace with a PSC motor. So your HVAC guys are installing this motor. This is the motor that we're going to put in in place of a PSC motor. It's called the Evergreen Retrofit ECM. The thing that's cool about these is, as a service tech, I can carry two of these motors with me. And having two of these motors with me, I could replace every possible PSC motor I might run into with very few exceptions. And those exceptions are just physical mounting points. But like this motor here will replace all these different size PSC motors. Then they make another one that goes from one half up to one horse. They're multi-voltage. They can run off 220 or, or 110. Um, one key thing about them is they're always green. So if you see a green motor, it's probably an evergreen. These are only suitable for replacing PSC motors, existing PSC motors. These are absolutely not compatible with nor suitable for replacing a factory installed ECM motor. They will not work with a factory ECM setup. They're only for replacing existing PSC motors. Okay? Critical that you know that. <clears throat> now these guys, instead of having a big 16-pin Molex, they're going to have a 5-pin Molex here and a 4-pin there. Okay? But again, notice the connectors here on the side of the motor. It's a big, nice, juicy Molex connector. These kits may come with a connector, a solid connector, or individual leads. Okay. Also, there's no capacitor associated with these again, and they're green. If it's a green motor, every one of these evergreens are green in color. Okay. The module is right here, so you can actually undo these screws and pull that module right off of the motor if you were so inclined. Also notice no cooling vents. Okay. The back is solid because of the construction. This is a module here with all the electronics in it, cooling vents are up here on the side. Um, if any of you want to take the initiative to learn more about motors, this website right here that's stamped on every Gentech Evergreen motor is an awesome website. I use it all the time. It's got a lot of information about motors, both PSC, ECMs, what's coming up in the industry, all that kind of stuff, troubleshooting guides, schematics, Hell, you name it. They've even got a 1-800 number you can call if you're having a problem with a motor, and they'll help you right on the phone. So really good website for anyone who's wanting to take the initiative to learn more about motors.
good stuff there. And just to talk a little bit about the major performance differences between a PSC and an ECM. So PSC motors are 60% electrically efficient and they produce a lot of heat. So 60% of the energy they use is used for work, for turning the motor, and 40% is converted to heat. That's why they have all those cooling holes in them. They make a lot of heat. Okay? And that's 60% at best. Some are way less than that. ECM motors are 80% and up efficient. They don't produce nearly as much heat. They're better at converting electrical energy into work. So that's what makes them way more efficient and better motors. Uh, one thing that you need to know is as static pressure goes up, and hopefully you all understand static pressure. We've talked about it a little bit. At least you've heard the term. But as static pressure in a system goes up, PSC motors actually move less air. In the industry, we call it they get lazy. If static pressure goes up, the PSC motor gets lazy and it moves less air. That starts to screw up your efficiencies, especially with air conditioning. It starts to cause problems with temperature rises on your furnace. ECM motors, airflow remains consistent or constant. They're also known as constant torque motors. And the way an ECM does that is it ramps itself up. It draws more amps. It increases its torque as static pressure goes up. And that's why we have to be very, very careful when we're installing ECM motors because as static pressure goes up, a PSC motor will actually draw less amps. Okay? But an ECM motor will draw higher amps because we've told it. You tell the ECM motor, hey, I want 800 CFM. It'll go, okay, 800 CFM no matter what. So I've actually seen instances in our program where someone took out a PSC motor that was running at maybe 2 amps, put in an ECM motor, but because static pressure was so high, now the ECM motor was drawing 6 amps or 8 amps. And the math is real easy. Amps times volts equals watts. I mean, it's three times as much if you've got high static pressure. So in some instances, we did the customer a horrible disservice because we didn't check static pressure. You should never be installing an ECM motor in a system with static pressure over nine inches of water column. We learned that the hard way already once. We blew yep. ahead on one. Yeah, you're asking for trouble. They will go bad. And my personal opinion, this is my personal opinion, if your static pressure is over 0.8 inches of water column, I wouldn't put an ECM in. I would figure out what's wrong with your static pressure if that's the route you want to go. Um, you'll find on almost all mobile homes, static pressure is high in those systems because they're just crappy duct systems. Mobile homes are not necessarily good candidates for ECM retrofit motors. If you're going to do that, be sure you're checking static pressure. Okay? ECM There's a reason they don't actually sell them like that, though. That's, that's right. <laughs> ECM motors are great motors. They are more efficient. They will improve a system. They can fix a lot of problems, but you've got to keep this little tidbit in mind right here. If your static pressure is over 0.9 inches, an ECM motor is a horrible choice. It will not fix the system, and it will cause you callbacks and problems you don't want to deal with. Okay? Some of you already know that. And that's all I got for you guys. Do you guys have any questions, comments, or anything? Yeah, I just wanted to add something. Um, typically, ECM motors have such a high payback, you can add like a media filter box or extra duct work if you have the availability to install it to reduce your static pressure. So Absolutely. All that cost can be added to the SIR of the, the motor itself. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Um, you can, you know, roll that into your cost if you can figure out what's your static pressure problem and what we might do to fix it. Um, quite honestly, guys, most of the time fixing static pressure is just the ability to add more return air. That's just a rule of thumb. Okay? Generally speaking, it's been my experience, the industry's experience, that most static pressure problems are in the return. That being said, will you find static pressure problems in supply? Absolutely. I've seen that plenty of times too. But the return system is a good place to start. Okay? That's, is that normally because they, uh, when people build a house, they don't put uh, returns in basements, but they'll add deliveries? Yep, or that's, is that normally the reason? 
that's one reason why, because most homes are built with a lack of return air. Um, they figure, oh, one return in the hallway upstairs in the house is enough. It's not. It's really not. Um, another thing we see that, that, that in our program that causes high static is the, the trail houses or the hoarder houses. So there's 10 vents in the house and nine of them are covered with crap. That would create high static. Same with the returns. So you've got a house with three returns in it and all three of them are piled up with uh, whatever our clients pile up in their houses. If you see those types of houses, you know, they probably have high static because... Yeah, we tell them the more, the more stuff they put on the vents, the better it is for their house. Yeah. <laughs> so those are things to keep in mind. I got a question for you, Wade, and I hope this is not too far off topic, but I, it's the question I posed to you last week about uh, all electric. You know, we have oh, yeah. Electric air furnace. When, when is an ECM motor a good option on, in, on an electric furnace? Or is it? And it can be converted to gas. An ECM motor is a good option on any air handler that has a PSC motor, so even an electric furnace. Okay? So the electric furnace has electric strip heat in it that produces the heat, which, by the way, if you guys didn't know, electric resistance heat is 100% efficient. Everything you put in it is exactly what you get out of it in heat. So the industry says electric heat is 100% efficient. The problem is electricity costs so much more than gas. But anyway, yes, an electric furnace that has an existing PSC motor in it. That's a whole other subject to argue about. And ECM will improve the airflow. Assuming static pressure is not too high, it will reduce the overall electrical consumption on that furnace because now you're changing the amp draw. And this, this is a really common example. So I have a PSC motor in an air handler running at 4 amps. We put in an ECM and the static pressure is not out of this world and the ECM motor will draw an amp or less. So we've really made a significant reduction in their wattage consumed by that motor. Will the ECM motor change anything on the re resistance heat side? No, it's not going to reduce the amp draw on those electric heating elements. It will give better airflow, um, creates better efficiency because we're moving more of the heat into the space, that type of thing. But yeah, anytime there's a PSC motor in any air handler, it's worth evaluating for an ECM, but always make sure that someone, if it's not you, someone is double checking static pressure. Because if it's over 0.9 inches of water column, you're doing the customer a horrible disservice and I guarantee you'll get a call back. So by putting an ECM motor into uh, an electric forced furnace with the heat strip, it could actually save the client some money. Yes. Even though technically it's 100% efficient, we're, we're, the efficiency we're talking about the heat strip, not the delivery. Yeah, we're talking two different systems there. So the heating elements, the part that makes the heat, yes, they're 100% efficient because every watt you put in them, you get one watt out in heat energy. But the motor is the second part of that system. And a PSC motor, as I mentioned, is only 60% efficient at best, at very best. So Putting in the ECM motor will save them money on the air movement side, but it's not going to change anything on the electric resistance heat side. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I would imagine as uh, if you guys run into that, uh, auditors specifically, if you run into that, uh, you'll probably have some questions about how in the world to uh, show an SIR on that. and. When you do run into it, reach out to me and let's let's work through it. So, I got a couple questions. Go ahead. Oh, so at at what at how old should we not be looking at putting them in? Ten years, twelve years, eight years. You know, as far as payback, if you know, in our audit, you know, the furnace we're only looking at keeping a furnace for fifteen. That's a good question. What do you think, Wade? So let me make sure I understand you're right. You've got a furnace that's 15 years old, for example. Should I evaluate that for an ECM or not? Is that your question? Yeah, something like that, or 12 years old. You know, okay. we're expecting I, you to have a three-year span, you know, lifespan life. Yeah, I would probably 
you know, we could go to our guidelines and maybe get some guidance. If that, if if you're going to spend, and I, I can't remember exactly what the numbers are, but I think it's like three hundred dollars. If you're going to spend more than three hundred dollars on that furnace, you're probably better off looking at just evaluating it for replacement. Yeah, and so that's, that, that's a, ten, the ten year mark. Yeah, if I've got a furnace that's that old, I mean, the one question I'm going to ask myself is, what is it costing me to put this ECM motor in it, and is it worth it? Or, you know, if that furnace is only going to last another few years, is it worth putting that motor in? Probably not. Um, chances are you'll be back there replacing it when it does go out. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's what I would look at. I mean, if you're talking 12 years and older, just ask yourself that question. What kind of shape is this furnace in? What kind of furnace is it? You know, um, now a lot of the builder's grade stuff after 12 years, they just start having issues. And really, in my opinion, putting an ECM motor, a nice motor in a furnace like that really isn't worth it. I would be looking at evaluating it for replacement. That's my input on it. Um, that being said, so let's say you got a furnace that's 12 years old and it's in great shape and you figure, heck, if the client takes care of this, they can get another 10 years out of it. Is the ECM motor worth it? Sure, it'll save them money. Okay? Assuming static pressure is good. But most of the stuff you guys run into out there, um, if it's that old, I'd be looking at a way to replace it and not spend any money on it. Because like Lauren said, you'll probably be back in a few years. Yeah, thanks for that, Tony. That's an excellent point that you definitely want to take into consideration the age of the equipment and, and its expected lifespan. So, so are there the any other questions? The next question is in the guidelines, you know, when they evaluate for the ECM motors, it's only evaluating for the heat season. What about the cooling season? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. Are you talking about, where in the guidelines are you talking about? Are you talking about in the audit section? The audit guidelines. All right, let me get there. Yeah, during the heating so, season, if you can get it to give an SIR of one, though, you're still in good shape. Oh, yeah, and it'll save across the board. I mean, if you're saving them in heating, you're sure as hell saving them in cooling. If, I mean, if they got AC on it and you put it in an ECM motor, absolutely, the savings is across the board through both of the seasons. And not only that, that ECM motor, if it's done right and all the airflow is good, it actually improves the efficiency of their air conditioner. Air conditioning is all about airflow, guys. And but that's where you got to be a little more careful with static pressure because when you get into the cooling, it'll actually raise it a little bit. Yeah, exactly. you got to make sure you're checking both sides of that because in cooling, that fan's going to run at a higher speed, which means more airflow, and more airflow means potentially higher static. So again, that's, that's the caveat with these motors. You've got to understand static pressure and what you're getting yourself into when you're putting them in. But yeah, absolutely. If you're saving them money, if you've got an SIR of one and you evaluate it on the heating side, I guarantee you you're saving them money and making their air conditioner more efficient if it's done right. So, Tony, were you asking, like, can you, can you include the savings that you would get from the air conditioning side of things to show the payback? Yeah, we know it's going to save. It's just not in there. It's not right, and I think the, the calculator, too, it only um, has you input the heating degree days. It does not have you input the cooling degree days. Okay. Would, would that help? Like, like, do you guys want, do you want the calculator to let you do more ECMs, or would you prefer to have it stay just looking at heating degree days? Like, on, on the website, it has both. I think the bigger I think the bigger question is is how close on a to a one o or a point nine or point eight uh, SIR are we getting to where we would need to add it? Yeah, I um, I'd say at at this point I I think it's a fair question. Um, as you guys run into it, loop me in on what's going on, and, and we can look at the next few of them and, and kind of decide. Like if you're running into it where it's just barely not paying back. And we really want it to. We could look at that, but at the same time, is is this ever putting us in a situation where, like, we're really close to just being able to replace the whole furnace anyway? Right, but that's the problem. It always pays back. And are we avoiding the warranty of the like a newer furnace when we put in one of these? That, yeah, that that's a, something else we need to consider. 
I, I would imagine you probably are in, in most cases. So. so if we haven't been doing it because of that, I mean, do you want us to document everything? Is that how we're supposed to be documenting it? Yeah, just make just make a note. Like, so, so from the audit side of things, I have on my little checklist, I just have a thing that says, did you evaluate for an ECM? And the evaluation is all of this. It's, you know, I looked at the equipment and I thought about it. And we realized, no, the, the effective age of this equipment made this a not, not a good candidate. Or this, this equipment was, uh, it was two years old. It was still under warranty. And we didn't want to avoid the warranty. Just some indication in your notes that you you guys are thinking about this and and that you're not, you know. That I want to see that we're actually considering this. Do you want to consider for mobile homes too? Well, and like Wade was talking about. So if if the on a mobile home, yes. Um, I, well, I, I would say yes for now. If if we find that 99% of the time the static pressure is uh, not within range, then, you know, once we have that little pile of data, then we can just say, you know what, I'll, we'll just put something in the guidelines to stop wasting our time. I, I speculate that on mobile homes, you guys will find that's the case. 90% or higher of the time, the static pressure is going to be too high, and there's not a lot you can do to fix it, or at least not a lot you can do that's cost effective or even worth your time to bother with. Well, That's what I suspect we'll find. We can't really predict the filter condition for the client. We don't know, like when we go in there, it might test out at a 0.9. And we say, oh, yeah, let's do it. That might be a clean filter. That might be a washable filter. And if the client puts in anything different later on, it's going to become a problem. And the guys also recommend putting in a 4-inch filter on those, too. Yeah, ab absolutely. That's, you know... I mean, all these things you got to evaluate. I always say we, we can't make decisions based on what might happen in the future. We kind of have to live in the now. But yeah, if you got a client who is not going to do maintenance, um, and we know that's a lot of our clients, unfortunately, an ECM motor is going to have a problem. If they won't clean their filter, I can guarantee you they're going to get to a point where their static pressure is through the roof, and they could potentially burn that motor up. That's absolutely a problem. I've seen it happen before. Home, though, because the mobile home filters, they've constantly been a problem for us. You know, when we put in anything that's not a, a washable filter, hogs air, right. we see static pressure go through the roof, even with just installing that filter. Oh, yeah. No, I agree. Mobile homes are a problem, problem childs at best. So I guess this is a, a question to Matt, then. Why, are we evaluate, why do we have to document that on every single mobile home when we establish that this is potentially... You know, 99% of these are not going to work. Um, we uh, we could definitely have a conversation about changing what's in the guidelines. If 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 that if that's the consensus that uh, there really is not much of an opportunity on mobile homes, we could we could write mobile homes right out of it. Some of the um, mobile home but, furnace manufacturers even say don't use a pollute filter on their furnace. Yeah. What do you think, Wade? Do you, do, you, do you feel like we should collect a little more data, or do you feel like that really is what we're going to find most of the time on mobile homes? I am uh, highly convinced that's what we'll find. I, I would really leave it up to the agencies. If you guys want to evaluate them, go for it. If you don't want to evaluate them, I'm fine with this just making a blanket statement that says you don't have to. Um, I, I've looked at enough mobile homes. I, I know what you're going to find. You guys have looked at enough mobile homes. You know what you're going to find. Um, they're just poor candidates because the duct system is so crappy and it's so hard to fix the duct system. So really, I, I, you know, my opinion is don't waste your time on it, but it's up to you guys. I, I know some of you are going to say, oh, well, we want to, we want to look at it, we want to see what we can do. That's fine, go for it. Um, I'm pretty positive that you're going to find over 90% of the time there's not a good opportunity for an ECM in mobile homes. You guys like that approach? All right, I will. Uh, I'll make a note of that, and uh, we'll we'll edit that in in our next upcoming edit of the guidelines. But uh, you're welcome to uh, go ahead and do that from this point forward. Okay, so on um, furnaces with a cabinets, is it just okay just to write it in there as furnace has an a cabinet? Or the little four, the little fourteen and a half inch wide dudes that the ECM motors don't fit in. Yeah. Yeah. Just. Make a note. It won't fit. That's fine. I get it. You're going to run into those. The ECM motors physically won't fit in those. Would the model number be note enough? You know, 
we've trained people to read model numbers and to know what that model number means. Just cut a hole in the side. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that, whatever designation, you know, I mean, just a simple note, hey, this is a, you know, 14-inch wide cabinet, ECM motor won't fit, a picture, whatever. Um, some people can read model numbers, some people can't, whatever works. I mean, I get it, you're going to run into those situations where they won't fit, where they physically won't fit. You're going to run into, uh, if I remember right, it's some of the older ream furnaces that have this really funky motor mounting thing, and the evergreen motors typically won't work in them because of the physical motor mounts. So just a simple no, you know, hey, the thing won't mount in here. I'm all good with that. Ian, I'm I'm fine if uh, if a model number indicates that, and you've trained your guys on that. If if they make no other note, I don't mind. Uh, that's a decision for you as a coordinator, because I can educate myself and look for that when I'm when I'm determining whether or not you know that was a candidate uh, for an ECM or not. Um, I. It's really up to you. If, like I, I would kind of lean the other way and, and say I, I would like my guys to actually make a note and indicate so I can see that they thought about it. But you know, if your guys are trained and you you're you know you don't want them to bother with that, the model number would work fine for me. Cool. Any other questions or concerns? Uh, I all I was going to do is go over and the. Uh, Audit guidelines don't really have a lot on this. I just wanted to point out that we just have a little section on there. It talks about the static pressure, and there's a little more information about where to learn some more about that. So um, just as an FYI. But, and just for everybody's info that, you know, that's my, my stake in this is that we want the auditors to be noticing these and evaluating for these when they get to them. And so if you are seeing some of this on a work order, that's, you know, that's what's going on. If, if you're a technician and you see stuff coming up on a work order, but you can see that the auditor may not clearly understand what's going on, uh, work together to educate one another and, and, you know, so that we can all get better at this is kind of the goal.